for the Baltimore Washington Conference of the United Methodist Church. Uh, if you were at 9 o'clock, we didn't hear that because I uh, forgot to mention it. Uh, but it is really critical to this 10,000 hours and some of the concepts that we are uh, raising here. Uh, and that is, here's the statement. Our vision is to become fully alive in Christ and make a difference in a diverse and ever-changing world. I'll say it again. Our vision is to become fully alive in Christ and make a difference in a diverse and ever-changing world. And so that's the vision statement for all of our churches, that were, or for the Baltimore Washington Conference of the United Methodist Church, uh, which makes up the United Methodist Churches in our geographic Area. Did she mention that last week? No. 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 I wasn't here. Yeah. All right, she is. She mentioned my con that's what I was getting at, Cindy. Thank you, Cindy, for paying attention to my contribution. Uh, I was on the team that developed the statement. And my specific contribution is very important to me in everything that we did uh, as that council. We were on the bishop's council. I'm no longer on that team. Um, not because I did anything wrong. I signed it out. Signed it out. But anyway, to, to remain nimble, I felt the church needs to be nimble. Uh, and so when we were working on this statement, which we worked on for far too long, uh, at the very last hour, I felt like a congressman. At the very last hour, I got some wording in there uh, that, that met that challenge, and that is the ever-changing world. It's a fact. We live in an ever-changing world. And that doesn't matter whether we're talking about the church or whether we're talking about uh, family life, whether we're talking about our work or our hobbies, uh, just culture in general, technology, oh my goodness. Uh, I think uh, Annika asked me this week because I was watching a show that I will not name, <laughs> it's embarrassing, that I used to watch when I was in high school. It came out in the 1990s when I was in high school. And so this week I was watching reruns. What was it? You're right, 90210. <laughs> 90210. Uh, I was watching that this week and I got two comments one for Monica and one for Pastor Melissa. Pastor Melissa's comment was when she came around the corner and I was watching it on my phone, uh, she said, I mean, not my phone, uh, but she said, uh, and I, I was working at my desk, and she said, You better be glad. You're doing something productive. Otherwise, I would have bludgeoned you. <laughs> That's why I was watching. Uh, she, she can't understand why I'll, I'll watch that series again for the fifth time. Uh, but anyway, more importantly, for our purposes, Annika was like, could you have imagined in high school, when that show was first out, um, that you would be sitting here one day watching it on a phone? And I was like, oh, you know, no way. Of course not. Uh, but, you know, a profound statement and, and noticed by Annika. It's an ever-changing world. I mean, five years ago, uh, I guess the technology was starting, uh, but now you can watch anything on your phone. In fact, this week the NBA announced, the National Basketball Association announced that uh, they're going to start allowing fans to watch, purchase, and watch the last five minutes of a game on their phone. So, they, and in the article, in the press release, it's real. The last five minutes of a game you can purchase to watch your favorite team, no matter where you live in the world. Um, and they said it's specifically reaching the young people who are too distracted to watch a whole game. Too distracted. Now, that last five minutes of a game will probably take a half hour to 45 minutes. But that's another story. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the NBA addressing an ever-changing world, right? Uh, and so then I also heard this week, and this is not really totally new, and some of you that are in the medical profession um, would probably agree, but I heard in our, uh, a, a program on NPR, they were talking about telemedicine. And telemedicine where they were addressing the millennials who are too busy, so we have distraction and we have business, too busy to go to the doctor. And so telemedicine allows them to get a consultation uh, from their phone with a doctor or nurse that can consult with them, 
to diagnose them over the, over the video and, and uh, prescribe medicine for them. And they were talking about how that is uh, growing in states across the country. Uh, and then they were talking about some of the pitfalls with that, but it's a, it's a reality that um, they're addressing an ever-changing world. And then finally this week, uh, Pastor Elizabeth, this didn't happen this week, but we were talking about uh, the demise of shopping malls. Uh, well, there, some kind of statistic, like there hasn't been a new shopping mall built in the United States in the last 15 years anywhere. A traditional shopping mall. In fact, Owens Mills was just finally knocked down, right? And how that's a, addressing an ever-changing world. And this is actually going back to the concept of people actually wanting to uh, shop in community and be able to you know, sit out on tables outside as they go from shop to shop. And so, uh, but again, an ever-changing world. Well, in our scripture today, Jesus is addressing an ever-changing world. Uh, as he's having a conversation with some folks about the old way versus the new way. Um, and so he's catching some flack. He's getting some, um, he's getting some pushback. And they say, hey, what's up with your disciples? Your disciples, uh, we'll just use the choir for example. The choir, they're always partying. You go over to their house, they always got a bottle of wine and apple pie. And, uh, and so it's like one big party. And then you go over to Cindy's house and she's always prayerful and fasting and on her knees with her scripture. You know, she's like following John the Baptist way. You know, what's your people doing? And so he's getting this old versus new conversation. And so then Jesus um, addresses it by trying to use really three different metaphors. And first he talks about uh, the wedding guests and the groom. While the groom's still here, you know, kind of partying, you're not always going to have the groom. And so I picture when he's talking about this bridegroom and the wedding guests, and he kind of looks at them and he sees a little glaze on their eyes, like not quite getting it. And so then he says, All right, if you're not quite getting that, let me go to the next one. And then he talks about um, the, if you have a tear in your garment, and he talks about patching the old garment um, you know, with a patch from a new garment. And so he says, that doesn't actually work very well. And so then he looks at him and he says, well, maybe if you don't get that, I'm going to tell you a third way. And the third way sinks in because they're all a bunch of people like the choir and they're drinking all the time. <laughs> and so, that's a joke. I don't know about the drinking habits of our choir. <laughs> they sounded beautiful this morning. That's all that matters. <laughs> but anyway, so he uses a wine metaphor. And so he talks about when you're making wine, you can't put new wine in old wine skins. I'll assume for a moment that you all don't know anything about making wine or that you drink wine or anything like that. Uh, so I'll break it down just a little bit further than what we have in the scripture here. Uh, and so basically, the new wine is wine that is not fermented all the way yet. Okay? And so it's a new batch uh, that's being prepared. Uh, and so Jesus is saying you can't take that product that's not fully developed yet, and put it in old wine skins. And here's why. When wine is fermenting, uh, it's in the fermentation process, uh, it's going to heat, it's going to bubble, and it's going to do what? Expand. 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 And it will burst if you put it in old wine skins. And the reason it will burst in old wine skins is that old wine skins have already, the leather, has already expanded uh, through a previous process. And so that it, all the room there is, is all the room there is. And in fact, there might even be some cracks and things from the last process. And so you can't put that new wine in the old, otherwise when it heats, when it bubbles, when it expands, it will, at the very loose end, burst. And so now you've lost the new wine, and you've lost that old wine skin. And you put old wine in old wine skins, because it's not going to expand. But you can't put new wine in old wine skins. And so Jesus basically here then is saying, look, in an ever-changing world, in an ever-changing world, world, our discipleship has to change with it. It is absolutely true that the gospel remains the same. And that God is the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. 
But the way that we are going to live out our discipleship, the way that we are going to go out and make disciples in the name of Christ, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, um, we have to be able to address an ever-changing world. And so and that's exactly what Jesus is doing here. Is he's taking the old, old story. That God the Creator <laughs> wants to have a relationship with them. And he's putting it into new wineskins. And so with that, he's getting some pushback. And he's saying, you know, and so now he's had to stop to address that. And so with our series here, 10,000 Hours, um, this is a great passage for us to stop and pause and think about for a moment. Last week we were talking about uh, how uh, we want to, uh, to serve Christ, to say thank you to God for what Jesus did for us on the cross. Uh, we want our hearts to be in a transformation mode to where we want to go out and we want to share that with others. And we talked about committing 10,000 hours to that. And the reason we use that is because of the work of Dr. Erickson that says you put 10,000 hours of, um, of practice into a craft, um, then you, you can become a professional in that craft. And so for fun, we use that concept to say, we want to be professional disciples of Jesus. And so this week we look at that further, and we unpack that in a, in a way that we're looking at these you know, possibilities as new wineskins. If we're going to reach an ever-changing world, we need some new wineskins. And the church, we, the church, can either help that, or we can hinder that process. Um, one of the things ways to start with that is, is to think about this. The church is not somewhere we go. The church is not somewhere we go. It's not a building. Like, let's go to the church. The church is something we are. We are the church. That old children's song. We are the church. So look to your neighbor and say, we are the church. If we think too highly of, or let me rephrase that. Here's where that statement becomes an issue, if we're not careful. If we forget that, then we're not in a position to reach an ever-changing world. We get too caught up into the church as a building. Now we do have to be concerned about our building. That's why we have trustees church councils and volunteers to take care of the property. We can't get away from that. What we must not forget is that it's we, the people, that are the church. And our focus, number one, has to be on we, the people, as the church. Because of what that leads to. The church, at its best, always equipped people. So from the very, so this is not a new one skin, the concept. It's an old, old story. The church and its best has always equipped people to live out their faith in the world. But you have, and you have to be in the world to influence the world. Okay? We can't influence the world from just staying inside these four walls and from the wall. You have to be outside of the walls. And the church was developed and formed by the Holy Spirit and commissioned by Jesus to go and do just that, to be out into the world. Not of the world, as Paul warned, but be in the world, because that's where transformation is needed. And the church, when it's at its best, remembers that. That that's our purpose. That's our vision. That's our mission, is to go out into the world. The problem is, as a whole, the church worldwide, in the last 25, 30 years, um, has forgotten that. Has forgotten that. And at times, you and I have forgotten that. And the issue is, what that leads to. What that leads to when we forget that we are the church, and this building's not the church, what it leads to is uh, the movement that started again about 30 years ago of programming to meet every need of every person. 
And so the church, 30 years ago, the churches that were expanding and growing and planting in our communities all around the country, um, they said, look, we get together and we program and we meet Liz's needs and we meet Dennis's needs, we meet Cindy's needs, and we can do it all here and we can call the whole community together and we can get people that are not getting their needs met other places and we can come back right here. We become Walmart. The Walmart church, in other words. So let's do that. And so that works for a while. And it did work for a while. And, and if your goal is to get people to come 30 years ago, in the 1980s and 90s, it worked. The problem is, it led to, and it leads to, and it has led to, a concept called consumer Christians. Consumer Christians. So Christians not worried about going out into the world to influence it in the name of Christ. The consumer Christians that are worried about coming in here and purchasing religious products. And then what that leads to is dissatisfaction eventually. Eventually. I won't use any examples of churches, but it leads to, while not being fed here, so I'm going to, I'm not getting the items I want here on sale, so they don't have what I want here on Sunday, so I'm going to do what? Go somewhere else. And then I'm going to purchase those religious goods there for a while, and then that leads me dissatisfied after a while, and so then what I'm going to do? To do? Go somewhere else. Alright? Now, let me pause just for a second. We all know people like that. I'm not talking about moving churches for missional reasons or for conflict. I'm talking about you don't like the choir. The choir stinks, so I'm going to go somewhere else. Yeah, our choir stinks, but we all stay. Okay? <laughs> right, I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. Or the preacher's sermons, or this, you know, I'm being fed. You know, let's not get lost in those details. It's the consumer Christians. Uh, that we're talking about. And they start to begin to treat the church as a shopping mall. As a shopping mall. In turn, churches begin to consume the lives of the people. And people get burnt out from that. And then before you know what happens as the church is consuming families, we keep families from their families. And we keep families from their community. And it becomes all down inside these walls and relationships outside the walls are neglected. And then eventually we spit them back out dissatisfied as if they have virus remorse. And then some just eventually just stay home altogether as they go on around town and they can't find um, their home. Church that operates like that misses the point. They miss the Great Commission. They missed the opportunity to be the church in the world as the original apostles dreamed, as the Holy Spirit commissioned, as Jesus directed when he told us to go out and make disciples. And so, as we stand here today and we're thinking about serving the community and meeting the world's needs in the name of Christ, you've got to think about your own personal wineskins. They're still carrying around old wineskins to meet an ever-changing world that has new needs or needs packaged in new ways. And so it's an opportunity to be prayerful and say, Lord, help me realize where I am with this. Help me find where my passions, my hobbies, my work, my volunteerism in the community meets the need of the community. And help me realize and give me the energy and the courage and the resources to be able to work in the name of Christ outside of these walls. And then for the church leadership, Pastor Melissa and myself and the lay leaders here and in the parish, help us have the courage to not continue to try to fit the new wine into these old wineskins. And a prime example is being able to say yes to a nine-year-old little girl that has a dream and a vision, and to come alongside of her and help her, not tell her ten reasons why it's not possible, 
but give her the three things that she needs to be able to do it in terms of support. That's putting new wine and new wineskins. Going out as the basketball coach and the director of the league, as Liz does, not thinking of that as being separate from her discipleship, but figuring out ways to live out the love of Christ and to share that with others, even when she's tired and cranky, even when her assistant coach is getting on her nerves. Amen. Amen. Even when her assistant coach is laying on the floor in the last seconds of the game. But whatever it is, just thinking outside of these walls in order to meet the needs of the community. You don't need the church council's permission to love somebody in the community. That's old wineskins. You don't need thousands of dollars to make an impact in your neighborhood. That's old wineskins. We don't need 10,000 people gathered here on a Sunday morning for our church to make an impact. That's old wineskins. Some of the largest churches in the world, including in United Methodism, are discovering that the consumer model is dying out and that even the ones that have grown to 10 to 15,000 people on a weekend have discovered, they have discovered that in order, in order to continue to grow or to maintain their size, they have to get smaller. The new line is people crave community, small community. So these large churches, they have to uh, not break up, but start multiple site churches and emphasize the small groups and get in the homes and release people to work on their own in the community. So even they are realizing that. So we have an opportunity here as a parish to be able to work together and solve the community's needs. And I encourage you to think more about it this week as you go on your way. Don't try to keep putting new wine into old wine skins. Look for ways to, for God to use you in new ways this week and every week going forward. Amen?